Welcome to CX Today. My name is Charlie and today I'm delighted to be joined by Zeus Caravala, Principal Analyst and Founder of ZK Research. Zeus, it's always great to have you join us. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm doing good, Charlie. It seems like it's been oh, a couple of weeks since we talked last, right? So. <laughs> yeah, we're talking all the time, but it's always great to feature your insights on our channel. And uh, it's going to be very interesting to kind of pick the bones out of all the recent goings on at uh, Avaya. And uh, they've, of course, recently uh, appointed a new CEO, Alan Mazarek. And um, yeah, it's been a difficult time at Avaya um, after it's had a significant revenue decline. Yeah. From your conversation with him, kind of, what are you, your key takeaways about how he's going to kind of uh, steer the ship back on track? Yeah, so I was able to catch up with him last week, and you know, there was a lot of obviously with the, the with the pre-announce of, of of earnings and the CEO change, they had the, uh, the convertible debt come due. Right, there was a it was almost like the perfect storm of bad things that happened, or or things that happened anyways that created some negative sentiment in the market. And it certainly left a lot of questions open that I had, and so I wanted to see if I could get some of those answered. So I, you know, I requested a, a call with Alan, and Alan's always very good about uh, speaking very open and honestly with whoever you are, partners, customers, analysts, and I, he was that again. So one of the things I asked him is, you know, obviously he he left Vonage with quite a bit of notoriety as the person that took a company that, frankly was kind of a joke in the business world, right? The only thing people knew about it was that silly jingle that they had and turned it into a real business company. And so, you know, what did he see at Avaya that really appealed to him? And, and you know, he said, um, um, you know, he, he had been approached by a couple of the companies, but the company he really was interested in was Avaya. And he said, because of the assets the company had, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very well-known brand, particularly globally. If you think about the nature of the UCCC industry, there's only a few global brands, right? Most of the, the UCAS, CCAS vendors get most of their money from the US, a little bit more from Western Europe, and then have almost no presence everywhere else, where Avaya is in 190 countries, they've got 90,000 customers, they have a huge partner ecosystem, uh, they have a ton of patents, I think I looked at Wikipedia, they had 4,400, um, you know, at, at, uh, whenever that was, um, you know, written. And so he described that as an irreplaceable asset, meaning that you and I could go create a company today, Charlie, and we could not uh, build that set of assets, you know, that, uh, uh, that, that Avaya has today. In fact, if you just look at their customer base, it's kind of a who's who of the business world. They get all the major airlines, banks, government institutions, they all, all depend on Avaya technology. So that really appealed to him. Now, the next thing I wanted to get to was, well, you know what? Uh, what happened in the quarter, and how did you know the, the capital structure is is uh, being questioned right now? There's questions about whether you would actually go into bankruptcy again, go private again, and and he said definitively that's not in the plans. Right? The it, the plans are to stay the course. Um, I think much of the the anxiety in the capital markets came from the fact that they had the pre-announce with the capital structure earning. But he said actually. When that the capital structure is fine, they have to, they have about two hundred twenty one million in restricted cash in escrow right now, and that's to pay the two hundred fifty million dollar convertible note. So they have to raise a bit of money, obviously, but to pay the debt, which is only due, which is due in ten months, and so that that is due. And he said the rest of the debt that stack though isn't really due to 27, 2027, 2028. So from that perspective, the company is actually fine. Um, from a capital standpoint, he also did remind me, you know, that if you look at the revenues of I has, it's somewhere this year going to be between two and three billion. You know, they pre-announced they were on a three billion dollar run rate, so it's going to be uh, somewhere in that probably two and a half billion dollar range. That's a lot of money, right? It, it two and a half billion dollars makes them one of the largest communications player in, in the industry, and so if managed correctly, right, that capital structure is fine. They can generate enough cash. Um, but he did say that um, he did admit that the the from a product standpoint and a culture standpoint, the company did need a lot of work there, and that's where he would spend all of his time. Mm. Yeah, lots of great stuff there, and it's interesting that you mentioned kind of um, how Maserat kind of 
uh, turned Vonage around from the company, as you said, the silly jingles. Uh, I remember kind of a bizarre yeah. advert campaign that went along as uh, yeah, they had guys that. jumping off the rooftops and skis and things like that, right? And yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's it's great. And he really did turn that around, as you said. I mean, he, yeah. they purchased New Voice Media. That was a big CPaaS company, which I can't quite remember the name of. Uh, yeah, next one. Name of now. Yeah, that's the one. And um, yeah, you did the great job there. But how do you think his approach at Avaya will maybe compare and contrast with what he did at uh, Vonage? Yeah, I think it'll be, the playbook will be very similar, right? And he talked about at Vonage, he focused on three things, capital structure, culture, and product. And he said, if you don't have product to sell your customers, if you don't have product that adds value, then you can't really do anything, right? And, um, and so, he did, so we talked about capital structure, that seems to be okay. Um, but I do think the approach will be very similar. And so what he did at Vonage was he had this large consumer business um, that, was, that was generating, I think, about almost a billion dollars in revenue. And the company kept pouring money into it, but he knew that that was a market that was on the decline. In fact, it was his opinion that that business was going to go to zero, right? Free voices everywhere and things like that. And he made another comment where he said, legacy products, legacy technology can be very profitable if managed correctly. And I think back to other examples of technologies that covered, you know, when, when 3Com, uh, when the NIC market started declining, they managed well. They, they didn't put any more R&D into it, and they just created a cash generator machine. Dell is based off that whole business model, right? They, they acquired EMC, and they have a bunch of legacy products that they don't put a ton of R&D into, and it generates a lot of cash for the company. Similarly, Avaya has a massive on, on-prem base, legacy on-prem base, and he said that if you manage that correctly, it can churn a lot of cash. He said the problem is, from a product standpoint, they're, they're, he used the phrase, they're chasing every squirrel, where you know if, if you look, they're putting you know, uh, R&D dollars into handsets, into IX Workplace, into traditional contact center, to cloud contact center, to spaces, to Aura, right? And so you gotta pick a path. And I think what you'll see him do is manage it the same way. And that traditional business from Avaya, I believe, can be very profitable as well. If managed correctly, you then use that cash to fund the R&D from other areas, right? And, and, um, and so I do think the playbook will be very similar. And so this big, massive install base of customers that they have can be that, that um, revenue generating machine. He says, what doesn't work, though, is taking a legacy maintenance business and flipping it to subscription which is what the company had done. So it gave a, a bit of a false sense of where the company was and that it kept the revenues up, but the cash kept de- declining, which is to where they are today. And so I do think you know he'll manage that way. Now, the third piece of that was culture. We didn't spend a lot of time talking about that, but I've had a number of conversations with Avaya employees since he's taken over, and he, he has already had an impact. You know, Jim was very, uh, and, I, and I like, I, I did, you know, grow to like Jim. I, I appreciated his style to some degree, but he was very closed. He, um, you know, any employee communications he had tended to be recorded. Alan's very open and honest. He's it's got no scripts. Ask me whatever you want, and he's done a few of those. And so the employee base there does seem to be, um, uh, you know, much more um, uh, invigorated. I do think though, um, layoffs are coming, right? And I know that was probably a question you're going to ask. And I think that's okay, right? He, we, again, he and I talked about sort of the structure of Avaya, and he said, uh, you know, if you look at the way the company was running with a lot, a lot of the kind of squirrels they were chasing, to, to use his term, he, he did say you could add a ton of people and it wouldn't materially impact the business positively if those people aren't in the right places, right? So similarly, if you take out people from the business, from the right places, it won't materially impact revenue downward either. And so whenever a company goes through layoffs, there's always concerns, well, what's going to happen? You're going to leave you know, your customers hanging. You're not going to be able to fund as much R&D. But it's, it's his belief that you can actually be just as profitable, right, and just as, and in fact, maybe more so with the right people in the right places. And I think that's what he'll be looking to do. So, uh, I, so I, I do think that, um, again, if you look back at the playbook, he had with Vonage, it's very similar. And he's dealing with a very similar company, right? It just, I, I do think Avaya is probably in a stronger position than Vonage was when he took Vonage over, at least from a business standpoint. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting to hear that he's already having an impact um, on the yeah. culture already. I think, yeah, I think that's potentially um, huge. And it kind of 
you were talking a bit there about kind of the layoffs that's kind of I guess it's no huge surprise, especially kind of Microsoft laid off its retention team, one of its retention teams recently. Uh, Oracle have announced some layoffs. Um, but it'll be interesting to hear kind of your thoughts on where Avaya is going to go into the future. Do you think that it has a bright future ahead of it? I, I do. And, and because of the assets that we talked about, right, large revenue base, right, multi-billion dollar company in 190 countries, you know, all a, a ton of customers. And if you think of what Avaya has been through in the last few years, Charlie, uh, if customers are still with them today, right, they're obviously a very important vendor. And if you've been to, um, a, you know, any kind of international event, the perception of Avaya is actually very good, right? I, I go to Jitex every year, and Avaya is viewed in the same vein as an Oracle or a Cisco or a, a you know Salesforce. It's a very well-respected company, and when you think of the role they play, you know, in the contact center uh, for a lot of companies, that's the lifeblood of the the interface between the organization and its customers. So it does play a very important role there. Um, he's also you know been on the uh, he, he's going on the road. He's going to Galway to, to check out the R and D lab, and I think you'll see a better idea of what products they would go into. I tried to press him about: Do you need to be in the endpoint business? Do you need to be in the services business? Right? And he he said he doesn't know right now. He does need to take a look at the products and make some make some decisions from there. So I think based on his track record, based on the large revenue base that he has, and based on the fact that I think he does have more time to work with than people realize, right? Because the large debt isn't due for another five, six, seven years, I do think he will have the opportunity to turn the company around. And so, you know, are they going to be, you know, $10 billion in five years? I, I don't think so. But I do think you will see him be able to turn the tide and bring the company back up to growth that is that is profitable. And and that I think, um, and, and part of, and fairness to Jim too, I think the, the capital markets have changed a lot, Charlie, too. If you look at uh, a lot of its, you know, pure play UCAS, CCAS competitors, those companies were rewarded for one thing, and that's a growth um, almost irrespective of profitability, right? And in fact, if you've seen like the WeWork documentary and things like that, that everybody wanted growth, 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 and they didn't care about profitability. A lot of those companies, the stock price has been corrected, right? Ring Central's, you know, come down, I think, 80, 90%. Same with, you know, Zoom and a lot of these companies that were, um, were given a really high valuation because of growth, almost forced old management's hand into growing at all costs. Today, I think the capital market is much more interested in profitability, uh, which is why you see a correction in the market. And I do think given the size of the revenue base Avaya has, they have the opportunity to be very profitable. Um, and, uh, and and so for, you know, for those reasons, I do, I do think he will have the time to turn this around. It, it's not going to be, you know, overnight, but I do think it will be relatively quick and this time next year, I think we'll we'll see a, a dramatically different company. Yeah, yeah. Fingers crossed. I mean, I thought that was a great point. You know, the customers are still with them after kind of the things that have been going on recently. It shows just how critical a technology vendor they are, and it's going to be. Um, well, and, and the stuff's hard to replace. You know, you think of you, the especially in their customer base, right? They we we talk about customers flipping their contact centers to the cloud. The thirty thousand, forty thousand, fifty thousand, hundred thousand C contact centers haven't done that yet, right? And they're going to go through, they're not going to just turn off one system and turn on an old, a new system. They're going to have to go through this hybrid migration path. There is a lot of, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of application integration to be done, workflows, uh, that, you know, that it's, it's not a simple switch you can flip. And so, you know, I, I do think uh, in the small and mid market, um, Avaya, uh, that the, the vendor landscape is, you know, has been drawn there, and, and I think of Isolate, but in Avaya's core audience, which is the large enterprise base, I think how, what Context Center looks like there and the role that cloud plays is, is still being written, right? So cloud's going to be a key part of that, but it's not going to just be turn off your old system, turn on your new system. There is a long migration path to that. Mm. Yeah, absolutely, and I think at kind of an earlier point that you said they do have uh, a lot of things that other vendors um, don't have as well, such as, I know you're kind of a fan of this kind of CPaaS Route that they've been taking as well, and uh, the Experience Builders program, which I've heard you talk about yeah. before, as a, as a particularly kind of um, innovative idea. So, you know, fingers crossed, as I said, for the future of I. And uh, I think uh, it sounds like there's a promising beginnings with Maserec, but I guess time will tell. Um, but as always, uh, Zias, it's great to have you uh, join us. And uh, yeah, we always learn a lot when I speak to you. So, thank you for joining me. Always a pleasure, Charlie.
Excellent. And thank you everybody for watching as well. Bye for now.